Hi everyone, uh, Jeff Maroon here. I'm uh, wanting to discuss with you uh, The Iliad by Homer, book three. Um, and I'm looking specifically at the Robert's, Robert Fagel's translation of the work. All right, so here we go, let's jump into it. What I find interesting about this book and how this book begins is uh, the first two books were solely focused on the Greeks and the Greek army. This one, we kind of get to see a little bit of insight into the workings, the inner workings of the Trojans and their army and uh, their their big names, okay, the heavy hitters in their particular um, military or the, the formation of their cities or whatnot. All right, and so I think it's very interesting as this begins because it draws a contrast between the types of people that the Trojans and the Greeks are and their approach to this battle situation. So watch this, okay? Um, this is the very first chapter, I mean, very first paragraph of uh, book three. Uh, and it begins, now, with the squadrons marshaled, captains leading each, the Trojans came with cries and the din of war like wild fowl. When the long hoarse cries of cranes sweeps on against the sky and the great formations flee from winter's grim ungodly storms flying in force shrieking south to the ocean's gulf speeding blood and death to the pygmy warriors launching at daybreak savage battle down upon their heads but the Achaeans armies came on strong in silence breathing combat fury hearts ablaze to defend each other to the death so it's interesting here to me, you know, this is written uh, by a Greek, or the story is told by a Greek, um, Homer. And so the way these are characterized, it's almost as though um, the Trojans are being, are depicted as a little more savage, a little more uh, just louder, a little more barbaric, um, unrefined, a little more uncouth, if you will, sort of. Um, and the Greeks are the strong silent type. They're the ones who are just a little keeping their poise a little bit more and just breathing and that that anger is seething inside them. So I thought that was interesting how the writer contrasted those two uh, those two groups of, of men there. All right. And so what happens is um, as uh, we see at the top of 129 it says, now closer, closing front to front, the onset till Paris. Ah, Paris, this is the one we're after, right? Paris sprang from the Trojan forward ranks, a challenger, lithe, magnificent as a god. The skin of a leopard slung across his shoulders, a reflex bow at his back and battle sword at hip. And brandishing two sharp spears tipped in bronze, he strode forth, challenging all the Argive best to fight him face to face in mortal combat. Oh, what a cocksure just completely arrogant type of guy and the leopard thing across it. I, when I read this, I picture, I'm a big basketball fan. I picture back in the day, like Dennis Rodman with all his, you know, crazy hair and his tattoos and his piercings and his just wild antics and stuff like that. That's kind of how I see, uh, Paris here in this, in this, in this circumstance. Um, but watch. So Menelaus, who is Helen's husband, sees Paris, who stole his wife, all right? And it says, as soon as the warrior Menelaus marked him, Paris parading there with his big loping strides, flaunting before the troops, Atreides thrilled like a lion lighting on some handsome carcass, lucky to find an antlered stag or wild goat just as hunger strikes, he rips it, bolts it down, even with running dogs and lusty hunters rushing him. So... There's the, we have the, the epic simile here. So Menelaus, thrilled at heart, princely Paris there, right before his eyes, the outlaw, the adulterer. Now for revenge, he thought, and down he left from his chariot, fully armed, and hit the ground. Menelaus is out for blood. He's going to take this on. Watch this. But 
As soon as Magnificent Paris marked Atreides shining among the uh, champions, Paris' spirits shook. Backing into his friendly ranks, he cringed from death as one who rips, uh, who trips on a snake in a hilltop hollow, recoils, suddenly trembling, grips his knees and pallor, takes his cheeks, uh, and back he shrinks. So he dissolved again in the proud Trojan lines, dreading Atreides' magnificent, brave Paris. So he's not so brave after all. I kind of read that brave right there as kind of a sarcastic type of a thing. He's like, ha ha, uh, look at me. I'm, you know, the toughest guy around. I got my leopard and I got my spears and my sword and everything, and I'll take any of you guys on. And then he sees Agamemnon, and he's like, never mind. I'm going to whoop, and he just, you know, draws and kind of gets in his ranks right there and essentially chickens out. All right. So, Paris, having done that, um, his brother, Hector, totally different kind of guy, upbraids him, just gets so upset with this crazy antics and the stupid behavior, and blames Paris. Like, dude, the whole reason we're having to deal with this, this, uh, army that's you know coming at us it's it's all because of you man all right he says on uh page 130 about line no oh, let's say 57 where he says you curse uh he says you curse to your father your city and all your people a joy to our enemies rank disgrace to yourself so you can stand up to battling menelaus You'd soon feel his force, that man you robbed of his sumptuous, warm wife. No use to you then, the fine lyre and these, the gifts of Aphrodite, your long flowing locks and your striking looks. Not when you roll and couple with the dust. What cowards the men of Troy. Or years ago, they'd have decked you out in a suit of rocky armor, stoned you to death for all the wrongs you've done. All right, so Paris has his own brother just saying, man... You did us wrong. You brought all this on us. Paris's response? That's fair. You're right. So here's what we're going to do. I'll take Menelaus on myself. He and I will fight hand to hand. And whoever wins gets Helen. We'll stay here in peace. They can go back home to their cities, and that'll be that. And it seems that Hector thinks, all right, that's, let's do this. So in the meantime, Iris, the, the goddess Iris, goes to um, Helen. And it's interesting here because what we see Helen doing, I find this interesting, and, and this will make a little more sense when we get into and discuss the Odyssey a little bit more. Um, but it says here on line 150, she, she goes, Iris goes to see Helen and says, um, Helen was weaving a growing web, a dark red folded robe, working into the weft the endless bloody struggles, stallion breaking Trojans and Argives armed in bronze had suffered uh, all for her at the good, at the God of battle's hands. Oh, sorry. I tripped over my words there. But... The fact that she's working on weaving something, we'll see that with Penelope, uh, who is Odysseus's wife, uh, and, and that she uses that as a tactic um, whenever uh, she is being approached by suitors. So I, I want you to keep that in mind. Remember that for whenever we take a look at the Odyssey. Um, but uh, Iris goes and talks to her and says, hey, look, these guys, they're fighting this battle and they're fighting it all for you. Like, wow, is that not amazing that you are the center of all this attention? Your husband's here, Menelaus, and he's going to fight Paris. And this is how it's all going to play out. And it's interesting here because on page 133, about line 167, let's say, this is Helen. Says what, and with those words, the goddess filled her heart with yearning, warm and deep for her husband long ago, her city, and her parents. Quickly cloaking herself in shimmering linen, 
Out of her room she rushed, live tears welling, and not alone. Two of her women followed close behind her, okay, and goes on. So it's almost like she's like, she hears, your husband's here, and she's like, oh my God, I remember that. I remember my home, I remember my city, I remember my people, I remember my parents. Ah. Oh. She's got a weakness for her home because Troy is not her home. And when she goes out there, she meets up with Priam. Now Priam is the ruler of the city of Troy. He is ruler of all the Trojans. And Priam is sort of looking out and, and scanning the battlefield there where all of the Greek army is coming up and he's, he's looking at some of the ones that are kind of emerging as being, you know, obviously their best. And he's like, who's that person? And wow, who's that? And who's that? And he looks specifically at, sees Agamemnon um, and just is overwhelmed at just what a structure of a man he is and how uh, just amazed at his, at his presence. He sees Odysseus, not as big, not as strong, but, but still somebody who's still uh, a standout. He says, who is that? He says, that's Odysseus. Helen is telling him that's Odysseus. He's like, oh, I know Odysseus. Man, he is, he's a smart guy and he really knows how to talk. And even though he does not strike the same imposing figure just right off the bat as Agamemnon there's so much inside of him that it makes him intimidating in a different way. Yes, who is that? That's Ajax, another one of the great battle, uh, you know, soldiers, one of the top in the Greek army. Helen looks around and says, but I don't, I don't see my brothers. They must be somewhere else. And the text indicates that they are somewhere else. They've, they've passed on, but she doesn't know about it because she's been locked up in Troy the whole time. So, um, we see Menelaus and Paris come together to fight. Um, and the warriors on both sides lay down everything. Sit down on the ground. They're there to watch the show to see who comes out on top, Menelaus or Paris. And Paris wins the uh, you know, kind of like the coin toss, essentially. And he gets to go first. And what happens is he shoots his spear at Menelaus. Menelaus' shield catches it. Menelaus is fine, and his shield takes the blow. No big deal, right? And so Menelaus uh, throws his spear. His spear goes through uh, the shield of Paris and actually cuts through some of the, the, the armor that he has here in the war shirt, as it says in there. And, um, but it still holds, he has a maneuver, he maneuvers enough so that it doesn't actually, it's not a fatal blow that he, um, experiences there and he lives and they both live through this first battle that they have here. Um, however, it's interesting because Paris does start to choke on the chin strap of his helmet. All right. And it looks like he's not going to make it, but Aphrodite intervenes and Aphrodite removes uh, that for him. And if you remember, Aphrodite is the reason that he's here and he has Helen in the first place, because that was the wager that uh, Aphrodite uh, gave him when he was choosing Aphrodite as the most fair or the fairest of them all in the story that I mentioned earlier with the golden apple of discord. So Aphrodite is looking out for Paris because Paris did her a solid as well. All right. Um, and Aphrodite does go speak to Helen. And this is interesting, I think. Um, she says, this is on line 450 on page 141, it says, quickly, Paris is calling for you. Come back home. There he is in the bedroom, the bed with inlaid rings. He's glistening in all his beauty and his robes. You'd never dream he's come from fighting a man. You'd think he's off to a dance or slipped away from dancing, uh, stretching out at ease. 
<sighs> and Helen recognizes that this is Aphrodite who's saying this. And essentially, Helen just like, look, if you like Paris so much, then why don't you come off of Mount Olympus and just be with Paris? And I'll go back to my husband and we can just do away with this stuff. All right. Um, and so Helen is just sort of, I don't, I don't want to say she's challenging her, but she is wondering what gives with you and this guy. All right. Um, and Paris and Helen do end their time together. It says that they go because, you know, nothing has been settled yet. Helen is still in Paris's uh, clutches and they spend the night together, make love as if nothing has, has happened. Um, and the thing that I find interesting here at the very end, and I'll leave you with this thought. Um, if you look at mm, the last full section on page 143, um, it says, he led the way to bed. His wife went with him. And now, while the two made love in the large carved bed, Menelaus stalked like a wild beast up and down the lines where he could catch a glimpse of magnificent Paris. Not a single Trojan, this is interesting right here, not a single Trojan, none of their famous allies could point out Paris to battle-hungry Menelaus. Not that they would hide him out of friendship, even if someone saw him, all of them hated him like death. Black death. So Paris doesn't have a lot of fans. All right. Uh, and keep that in mind as we move to book four. Uh, I appreciate the time. I appreciate you coming here to listen to me talk about this uh, epic poem. And as you embark upon book four, I want to wish you, as always, happy reading.